media. We'll get started in just a couple more minutes. Um, we asked the folks rename themselves to include their names, pronouns, and the agency that you're with. Um, please remain muted um, unless called upon, although if you feel comfortable sharing your camera, please do so, so we can see your lovely faces this morning. Um, this meeting is going to be recorded um, so that folks who can't be here can review this material. Um, closed captioning service is available by clicking on the live transcript button that should pop up at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I think we're going to give people maybe just a minute or two to trickle in before starting. Thanks, everyone. I'm just going to unmute myself to say that um, what what's happening is, of course, the result of the fact that there are a lot of people coming to the meeting this morning and Sasha is doing a very deliberate process of, uh, of admitting people and um, we thank you all for your patience, of course, and for joining us this morning. It's always uh, a thrill, honestly, to see how many people sign up to partner and participate and join us and we're really so grateful for these opportunities to get together um, and to virtually feel our coalition presence. So thanks to everybody who's joining for the first time. Thanks to everyone who might be considered a coalition regular and thanks to everybody who might be in between. And we will, we will get going with our um, busy agenda shortly. Um, there's some really exciting and important news and also some things that are very sobering. So we're going to um, together, I think, walk through a full gamut of emotions this morning. <laughs> um. Thank you, Allison. And thank you everyone for being here this morning. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started so that we can get to the aforementioned packed agenda. Um, welcome everyone to the March meeting of the Seattle King County Coalition on Homelessness. I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. For those of you who might be joining us for the first time today, the coalition meets in this space on the third Thursday of every month from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. to share information and resources highlight timely local advocacy opportunities and create power and solidarity as a movement. Um, we like to start these meetings by having um, one of our coalition members read a copy of our mission statement. Um, this is a long-standing mission statement that helps ground us in the collective work that we are all engaged in. Um, Normally, I would look out to the audience and see whoever is most persistently avoiding eye contact with me to call on them to read the statement. Do we have anyone brave enough to unmute themselves? I can do it, Jason. Please, thank you so much. We mobilize our community to challenge systemic causes of homelessness and advocate for housing justice. Thank you. And then coalition staff Selena is going to expand upon that a little bit by sharing the vision and value statements that our coalition board put some good work into putting together around a year ago. Thank you, Caleb, for reading out our mission statement. Um, it's springtime, which is definitely a time of reflection. It's kind of oh, the year mark of COVID. And um, so we just wanted to remind everyone of our um, vision and value statement just to um, ground our work. Um, and so our vision is really um, a region that acts on a shared sense of responsibility to ensure that everyone has a home. Um, so thank you all for showing up to this meeting. Um, and then our values, which really drive our work, are equity, justice, and collective action. Um, and we've defined them as um, equity is to center race in the fight for housing justice as white supremacy and structural racism cause disparities in who experiences homelessness. Um, our definition of justice um, is to uphold the dignity and civil rights of people experiencing homelessness or housing insecurity. Um, and our last value is collective action, which to us means to collaborate, unite, and act to build power. Uh, 
Thank you so much, Selena and Jason and Kayla. Um, the coalition staff had a really powerful idea. We've historically, really before my time, so for a very long time at the coalition, begun our meetings by reading the mission statement uh, for many, many years until last year, that was the only collective statement. And we revised it with lots of input from our uh, board staff, but you all, our members, and then added a vision and our values statement. So I think the idea of giving us all the opportunity to ground ourselves in this way is, um, is an empowering one. And I hope that you join us in that um, sense and give us your feedback. Um, I want to ask now to have you join with me in a, a moment of, I would say silence, solidarity, and strength, um, and grief in recognizing the individuals who were murdered in a racist and sexist act of gun violence in Atlanta yesterday. I think that we all understand that we live in a nation that is not free of our past and present and the um, horrors of our gun culture and the ways in which um, white supremacy, hatred of a variety of types are embedded in what happens on a day-to-day -day basis in this country. And I venture to say that the mission, vision, and values that we are all striving to hold ourselves to um, are ways that we individually and collectively try to respond to those acts of hatred without being overwhelmed by the grief, but um, making sure that we also hold space, um, help and comfort each other and organize to um, ensure that this comes to an end. Patricia, thank you so much for noting that there will be a vigil. I know there's a lot of fantastic, powerful organizing happening around our community, and I hope that everyone will um, uh, share those resources. We'll be happy to signal boost, amplify, share the information so that people can um, join together and we can stand together um, to live our values together. Um, so I, I, I think we'll just hold a moment together uh, now. And in the meantime, Sasha, I'll just ask if you would please um, put our next slide up. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for joining in um, a symbolic and I hope useful recognition of, uh, um, of the loss, the terrible loss of life and the violence done um, to individuals and to our community in the name of um, values that we resist. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to share this image with all of you and recognize that it is an image, um, and I'll read it for those of you who may not be able to see it because the, um, the, the words are in a, in a color that doesn't necessarily show up well, but this is a quotation from the civil rights and queer rights and women's rights activist, lawyer, poet, Polly Murray, and it is the title of one of her books. Hope is a song in a weary throat. This image was created by two wonderful artists who live in Tacoma, uh, Jessica Spring and Chandler O'Leary, and they are very graciously working with us to help uh, make a copy of this image available. Um, we've been seeking a way to recognize for ourselves and for all of you 
and for the hundreds of people who are part of the coalition who aren't necessarily on this Zoom call this morning, the effects of not only a full year of the pandemic, um, but also the ongoing crises that predate and um, we know will post-date whenever the post um, comes to be. And I, I'm so glad for those who are making comments saying that this image is, is beautiful. I think it is as well. And, um, and I, I think it's beautiful in part because it recognizes both the hope that we feel with spring, as Selena noted, and with the fact that we have three highly effective vaccines that are not yet available enough, but are becoming more and more available. And also the weariness. <clears throat> Um, the weariness is real and we recognize it. And so I want to just say, you all who are here, um, you've made your way here. You're on our email list. You're on social media with us um, on our um, action alerts. Um, please invite other people to join you in signing up on those lists. We have some really important work, especially in the next couple of weeks, um, uh, as well as in the next couple of months. And really April 15th and May 20th are going to be very important general membership meetings for us. May 20th is actually our annual membership meeting. And we hope uh, that you will join us. That will be an extended meeting. And we're working on an agenda that we hope will include some beauty, some music, some song, as well as um, uh, our usual combination of information and action. So uh, I want to acknowledge that some of the hope is because of very strong advocacy work that you all have supported, that we have engaged in, that our partners in um, member organizations and at the public health department and the state department of health have worked on, which is I'm thrilled that there is a new definition of eligibility that means that as of yesterday, most of you who do direct services with people without homes or people who were homeless are in the current tier of those who are eligible for vaccines. I'm very grateful to Jody Rao from the Healthcare for the Homeless Network for joining us to talk a little bit more about this. And we have a very special guest, Director of Public Health Seattle and King County, Patty Hayes, who will be joining us at 10. Um, what I want to acknowledge is that that brings some relief and yet it doesn't mean that everybody who is eligible is going to get a vaccine appointment, much less a shot right away. So there is still a path to tread ahead of us. My understanding as of yesterday is that there is one dose of vaccine in King County for every eight eligible people currently. So that is obviously not great math. So I'm going to ask Jody to share with us what she is currently able to about this exciting news about how to support your um, colleagues and staff um, and how to answer some of the questions that, of course, have already come up. And then we'll continue to do more about that. And Jody, please um, take it away. Thanks, Allison. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> um, yeah, so this um, news kind of broke in my email box right at two o'clock with the um, weekly homeless service provider meeting that we we host over at Public Health and Healthcare for the Homeless. So um, we were, uh, I was frantically going uh, through emails, uh, kind of looking um, at my um, vaccine uh, partners and colleagues um, in other areas of public health. So a little bit of what we're looking at, given that we, um, we know that you know the supply is still constrained, um, and we're all you know on pins and needles waiting for that to open up, um, as we keep hearing that it will. <laughs> what um what we're working on right now is we're um, working with the city of Seattle, um, specifically around um, Lumen Field. And for any of you that were in the my side of the spectrum, I was like, where and what is Lumen Field? Uh, it's the Century Link that has now changed its name yet again. Um, and uh, so we're working to um, get you all uh, good link information. We're um, told that it has quite a bit of um, availability um, and people are actually getting some, some um, <clears throat> um, good appointments quickly and responses when they sign up. So we'll be sending that link out 
Um, additionally, we're looking at some of the um, high, medium and high volume sites um, that are operated through um, uh, Seattle King County Public Health, making sure that those sites are aware uh, that this group is now eligible. I know I heard yesterday there was some concern about needing to sort of prove in some way that you are eligible as this. And so I've, I've raised that up as well to my colleagues to make sure that that's as smooth as possible, not needing to you know, prove um, your, your employment uh, status. Um, so we're working to see if we can't um, figure out how to um, get some appointments uh, available through some of those slots. And then we're also looking um, at what we might be able to do in terms of um, utilizing our mobile teams um, to sort of set up a, a central clinic. Um, so we will not be sending our mobile teams to homeless service sites um, for, for staff. Um, once we uh, have the green light uh, right now, still tier four for people experiencing homelessness, we will be sending mobile teams out to you all. Anybody that is there on site is welcome to be um, vaccinated with our teams at that point. Um, but right now we're trying to figure out other venues and ways that we can get some access to staff uh, without sending our teams uh, to, to sites where we have to say no to people experiencing homelessness and yes to staff. So trying to create some of all very much in the works live conversation so um, this is uh, likely to change in some ways and as soon as I have some concrete information to share out I will be doing that um, both through you'll probably get it a million times because I'm going to send it out through my links and Allison's going to send it out through their links and more the merrier in that regard right so um, just another little uh, highlight for folks because um, I know this is coming up as we we were have started our series of community engagement meetings. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, if you didn't get that, um, throw something in the chat and I'll resend out that stuff. But um, we're doing materials development this week. Next week is where we're really going to be engaging with folks around how we prioritize sites, how we think about deploying these teams to your sites. Um, and then the following week is really around um, all the work around engagement and education, which is you know really been ongoing and, and will continue to do. But right now we're thinking we're going to have 11 teams, uh, mobile teams, and this will be five public health teams, one that will be totally dedicated to people living outdoors, unsheltered, um, regional hubs where folks might be accessing services. We'll have four that are dedicated to, you know, all the other kind of homeless service sites. Um, we were going to be partnering uh, with City of Seattle and the Seattle Fire Department. That will likely be another team. And then we think we're going to have about four to five uh, community partner teams. Um, so in total, one for unsheltered folks, one for unsheltered folks, 10 for um, uh, the rest of our sites. And so really thinking about how we uh, might start to deploy those as, as um, eligibility is starting to open up, supply becomes more um, hopefully uh, increased. Um, we are always gonna be constrained by supply. Um, and right now, not a lot of choice uh, around what's coming down the pipe to us to have availability. So uh, I think I'll stop there because I know we've got a tight agenda. Um, thanks, Allison. Jody, thank you very much to you and your Healthcare for the Homeless Network colleagues. I know there is just such a, a sense of excitement and possibility and also tension. So we will be deluging everyone <laughs> with information. We don't do it because we want to overwhelm you, but we do want you to help get the word out and the, there needs to be a loop. Send your questions. Jody and her colleagues are so committed to being good listeners and good partners. And um, we've all learned a lot about how we can work well together. I want to acknowledge that um, I put the new definition in the chat. We're really grateful to Tara Bostock from the State Department of Health, who's going to join us at 10 to talk a little bit from the state DOH perspective about that new definition. And then we will have Public Health Seattle and King County Director Patty Hayes and some opportunity for you to share some of your own work conditions and experiences. And I hope have time for a few questions because it is unusual for us to have um, 20 minutes or so with the health department director. And I really am grateful to her for coming to listen as well as share what she is able to. This is fast moving, there will be changes, there will be bumps, but I feel like we are in a position to create a really strong rollout, not only for staff, 
but also for people without homes. And there is so much need for you all to help make that work well. Um, and I'm I'm grateful that we have a community that is making that um, work thoughtful and a priority. So thanks, Jody, very much. And I'm going to um, go to Jason for our member updates. Thanks. Thank you, Allison. Um, before we get to all of that excellent content, we want to take a few minutes here for our coalition member updates. We'd like to hold a few minutes of these meetings to highlight new and expanded resources in the community, um, specifically as it relates to um, case management opportunities, day center services, shelter, things of that sort. If your program is opening up new services or expanding existing services, please feel free to contact me um, for a quick plug at these meetings because we try to make this a space to share information. Um, first, we have uh, Amber McDowell with Sound Generation, who has joined us to discuss a program that offers additional supports for vulnerable seniors in our community. Uh, Amber, thanks for being with us this morning. Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm with Sound Generations and I'm a part of the Geriatric Regional Assessment Team. <clears throat> Essentially, we are, um, we have a team of clinicians. We're kind of senior care advocates. So we're able to um, do clinical assessment um, so we can look at anxiety, depression, whether there's any um, cognitive deficit or decline. And then if there are any other things um, kind of making those symptoms worse, then we can address, you know, whether they need transportation, uh, primary care provider, um, nutrition. So we're really working with isolated elders, 55 and older, all throughout King County. It's completely free. And again, it's for those that, um, you know, might be dealing with mental health, substance use, or cognitive deficit or decline. And um, unfortunately, we do not work with um, homeless individuals, but I do like to speak to everyone because as soon as someone gets housed, we can support them. And um, also I like to hear from the community um, because maybe in the future, we can advocate for this program expanding. Um, we're not able, we're not crisis oriented, we're very brief intervention and then um, referral to long term supports. So if they're already in the hospital, if they're in a crisis, um, if they're being served by skilled nursing, or have suicidal or homicidal plan or intent, we aren't the, um, the right program for them. But if they don't have family or um, community support, um, maybe they're located in rural areas or again just are isolated and they're really struggling with mental health, substance use, or cognitive issues, then um, they can be referred to us. Um, thank you for listening. I think I have like one minute for questions, one or two minutes if anyone wants to ask. And I'm also available to talk to um, any of your teams or anyone individually. So you are only serving people who are housed is that in some fashion? Yes, yes. So no temporary housing, um, unhoused or in skilled nursing, adult family home. Um, yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Amber. Um, we will be Thank sharing uh, information about this program as well as Amber's contact information in the follow-up email that you all will be receiving after the meeting. Uh, the Thank other you very much. Thank you, Amber. Um, the other update for this portion of the meeting um, relates to the Roots Young Adult Shelter. Um, after uh, an extensive community process and having to relocate to a temporary location in Queen Anne, Roots has now moved into its new permanent home in the University District. Um, we were going to get this update from Kat Oosley, Director of Programming. Um, they are in their first week of their rollout and Kat got pulled into an emergency this morning, so they send their regards. Um, 
For those of you working with youth and young adults, Roots is a program that offers um, shelter beds and case management services to folks 18 to 24 in and around the university district. Their new location is 4541 19th Avenue Northeast um, in what used to be student housing uh, near Greek Row. The previous capacity of 50 beds is still in effect and they do currently have openings for folks who need it. Um, people who would like a referral should call the main routes number 206-632-1635 between 8 p.m. and 8.30 p.m. or arrive in person during those hours for an intake. Their day center services are not yet online, but they do plan to phase that in starting in late April. Um, we, and the, the last note that Kat asked me to send along is that providers who are interested in touring the new space are encouraged to send them an email if they would like to visit the new facility, um, which we will be providing in the follow-up email as well. Okay, wonderful. So next, we're going to transition here to let you all know about an exciting upcoming benefit for families with children who are eligible for free or reduced price lunch at the school they attend. Um, the pandemic EBT program that was initially launched last year is back for a second round of funding. Um, we're joined this morning by Megan Veith with Building Changes, who is going to give a brief overview of the program and explain uh, a little bit of how family service providers can help connect folks and make sure that they get these cards in a timely fashion. Megan, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Jason. Um, uh, yeah, as Jason said, my name is Megan Beef. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm from Building Changes. Um, wanted to give folks a quick update on this great benefit for families. Um, so this benefit was created earlier in the pandemic, so kind of last spring, summer. Um, and it's extended throughout this school year, so from September to, Jan to June. Um, hopefully it will be extended more, but currently it's to June. Um, and it's really to help students and families that are in low-income households be able to buy food. Um, and it's intended to kind of make up for those meals that kids missed um, while schools were closed, and then now kind of when they're doing like a hybrid schedule. Um, and, you know, families can use the cards to um, buy groceries, it's like a debit card. Um, some changes for this go around is that each student will get their own PEBT card. So if a family um, has three students and they're all eligible, they will be receiving three PEBT cards. Um, cards are, and notifications to families that they're eligible for PEBT. Um, we'll be starting to go out um, March 22nd, so in a few days. Um, families will first get a letter saying that they're eligible, and then, and then, and then following that, they'll have the actual card. Um, and then they have um, to use a PIN, um, but all the information on how to do that is going to be in the letter. Um, in terms of who's eligible right now, so it's any student that's enrolled in a K-12 through school that um, participates in the National School Lunch Program is eligible for free and reduced price school lunch. So that includes any child regardless of citizenship or immigration status. Um, this includes kids in foster care or unaccompanied homeless youth. Um, there's also going to be a, a new change from the last one is focusing more on uh, child care and um, early learning benefits uh, or benefits for those young, young kids. Um, the state, each state has to submit a separate plan for that. And so um, our state's currently working on that, but expect to see an update around that soon. Um, in terms of how much uh, a PEBT benefit is worth, so a little different than last go around. Um, it's gonna be based on the learning model for the majority of students at a school. So if, um, if a school is fully remote, then the student will get the benefit for all those five days they're remote and not able to go to school for those school meals. If a school um, majority of the students are going in, uh, for example, for two days, so they are able to get all their school meals on campus for two days, that means that for those three days where the majority of students are remote, they'll be able to get PEBT benefits. Um, we've been doing some advocacy on this because we know that, um, you know, students experiencing homelessness um, may have 
couple getting to school right now um, and may not fit in with what the majority of other students are doing. And we want to make sure that they um, are able to get that PEBT benefit. Um, and so we're doing some advocacy on that, but currently it's based on a majority school model. Um, and again, I just want to emphasize, though, that PEBT is, is for all eligible, eligible children, regardless of their status or their parents' status. So no one will ask about their immigration status or citizenship. Um, there's no application this go around. No one's going to be asking for a social security number. Um, it's not considered a public charge uh, determination. Um, so it's a really great benefit for that. Um, one of the other kind of issues that's happened is around addresses. So um, there was a deadline for March 8th for when um, schools would be submitting um, whatever the address that a student who was eligible had on file with the school, they would be sending it to get the cards dispersed. Um, unfortunately, um, that didn't go out very uh, in advance. And so um, a lot of schools uh, were scrambling to make sure that they had updated addresses. And that's very concerning, especially for the populations we serve, um, who can be very highly mobile. And so we're doing advocacy on that. Um, and OSPI is currently working on a way to update addresses right now. Um, and so if you're, uh, if you're working with a family that may not have had an updated address in their school system, um, I highly recommend um, encouraging them to talk to their school to make sure they can get their address up to date. Um, it's really important that their addresses are up to date so they can get the card sent to them. Um, because again, um, this benefit, this first round of benefits that goes out will be benefits that a family earned since September. Um, and so that could be in the hundreds of dollars per student um, if a school was like fully remote since September. Um, so it's really important that they get those benefits. Um, if their address wasn't updated, it, it wasn't a correct uh, um, address, um, and they can get it updated, then the earliest that their benefits will be sent out to that correct address um, would be in April. Um, another thing to, to note too, and again, we're doing some advocacy on this as well, is that if um, a card went to a, like an old address and that card was stolen and used by someone other than the family, um, that family is not allowed to get those benefits back at all, which is really unfortunate because again, if this, this for this first go around, that could be in the hundreds of dollars. So we're doing some advocacy around that. Um, but just, you know, in the meantime, just really encourage families to work with schools to make sure that their address is current. Um, also for families that are experiencing homelessness that may not have like a reliable address or an address at all, um, they're able to use the school's address or the district's address. So definitely work with schools to see which address um, their policy allows. Some schools are doing districts, some are doing the school. So um, just encourage families to work with schools or you know, you working with schools too to help clarify that for families and making sure that are able to get those cards. Um, let me see, I'm running out of time, but um, yeah, so I think that's that's all I had, um, but I'll definitely make sure I keep everybody updated on any changes, and I will put my email address in the chat if there's any questions. Um, this has been changing a lot, so I apologize if it's like a lot of information, um, but it's a great benefit for families, like I said, for for one student, um, that could be up to like $600 just this first go around, you know, since September. So, and really hoping that this benefit will extend longer than the school year, but um, TBD on that. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Megan. I really appreciate that explanation. Um, we have posted information uh, to our blog agenda, which I put in the chat here, explaining how um, you can go about verifying address and ordering a replacement card if necessary. I want to emphasize that the instructions that you see there are current as of today. I understand that DSHS and OSPI are in communication to potentially create a more streamlined process. For now, this is how it works. Um, we will make sure to provide update information as we get it. Um, I have sent a message out to our um, King County McKinney Vento liaison contacts to ask whether or not they are encouraging folks to 
go to the school district office or their school of origin for these mailings. We will make that information available as soon as we get it um, and use our communication platforms to let folks know if any significant changes occur. Uh, Megan, thank you again so much for being here. I have a question for Megan, if possible. Please, please. And Megan, you may have said this and I might have missed it, but I just want to get clarity on the card, the EBT card. This is a separate EBT card than their normal food stamp card. Yes. And, yes. Then, and then secondary, they'll get one card per child in the same household or would they get multiple cards per child? It's multiple cards. So if you're if you have like three kids, they all go to the same school, everything's the same, they're still going to get three cards. Okay. That's so, Yep. Yeah. Um, everyone, every eligible student will get their own card. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Great question, Mika. And thank you, Megan. And also, I want to just say this may go without saying, but the, the feedback loop, your family's experiences of how this is and isn't working is the other part of the advocacy loop. So please, please let us know, let Megan know. That's how we know how the theory is playing out for real hungry kids and families and how to press on advocacy to make this work better. Um, so we are yeah. really grateful, Megan, for your advocacy, for the clarity of the information that you're sharing. Jason is doing a great job of putting the current information up there, but um, I think we all understand that it should be simpler <laughs> and it should work better than it so far has. And so as usual, part of the role of direct service providers is to try to help benefit eligible people navigate a complicated, um, system of benefits that is not as streamlined as we would wish. So our work continues and I will move us into our um, primarily state level advocacy and we're going to rapidly um, gallop together through another set of important and complex information. Um, Selena has some really important information about staff, uh, excuse me, about um, uh, uh, advocacy opportunities that, um, that they'll be sharing. And I have some information about local and state advocacy, but we're gonna start with introducing you all to Melanie Smith. And it gives me great pleasure to, uh, to welcome Melanie, who has been to coalition meetings before and has been on our email list for many years, but we have never before had the pleasure of working together with Melanie who is the coalition's first ever contract lobbyist. Um, this is the year that we decided to add to our bandwidth and learn and grow by working with someone who is um, a contract lobbyist in virtual Olympia. So Melanie, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. And I know you're going to give everybody a quick um, intro of who you are and some of your expertise and experience and then also where we are in this virtual legislative session with so much activity. Thanks, Melly. Um, well, thank you, Allison. Um, hi, everyone. It's nice to meet you. I see a, a handful of familiar faces that I've, I've seen in Olympia over the years, so it's really great to be here with you. As Allison said, I'm Melanie Smith. I am a contract lobbyist and now your contract lobbyist. Um, I have been a lobbyist for 16 years, I think now, and um, the last 11 or 12 in Olympia. So um, it, is, uh, it is always fun and exciting at this time of year. Um, all of my work concentrates on health and human services. I have a strong concentration in behavioral health um, with about half of my current clients having an interest in behavioral health. Um, so it's been really an honor to work with Allison and Selena on this session. Um, we are just finishing the 10th week of the legislative session out of our uh, 15 weeks, roughly 15 weeks is what we have. Um, I think we're on day 67, if you're doing the actual count. So that puts us about two thirds through the time process. And um, because of the structure of the session, we're not quite halfway through the work. I mean, we're a little more than halfway through the work, um, but the, they front load all of the policy work into the first half of this session and then the last half of the session, it tends to be its own little animal. So um, we are a week away from policy cutoff, meaning that the opposite chambers policy committee from where the bill started um, 
is uh, has to be out of their relevant policy committee in the opposite chamber by a week from tomorrow. So not a whole lot of time left in that policy committee. And then it has a further week to get out of the fiscal committees and then it's back to floor work for essentially the rest of session. Um, the last five weeks of session are really dedicated to two big areas of work, each of which take their own um, approach. So the one is getting all of the policy bills through the rest of the of the session, right? So um, figuring out, particularly after they will come off of the opposite chamber floor in about three weeks, that delicate balance of when the House and Senate don't agree, this is usually the time of year where they start really hating each other. And so I'm deeply curious how this is gonna play out in a virtual landscape. Usually we lobbyists, we stand around on the third floor and we can tell a lot about what's happening by who is crossing from what chamber to the other and how they're walking. Like a lot of information can be had as to how fast Pat Sullivan is, is moving. Um, so. I think as always in the virtual world, it's hard to keep track of that information when we can't see it with our eyes, but I think we're I think we're doing better than I expected, honestly, in the virtual session. The other big thing that happens in the last half of the in the last two, last third of the session, sorry, is the budget, which is of course the biggest piece of policy that the legislature will do. Um, the budget is uh, I have heard that the budgets will be released to the end of next week. The House is scheduled to be releasing their budget on Friday. The Senate will be releasing their budget the day before that on Thursday. Then they will be immediately followed by hearings. So I believe that the Senate will be hearing their budget on. Let me back that up. The House, the Senate is releasing their budget on Thursday and hearing it on Friday. And the House will be releasing their budget on Friday and hearing it on Saturday. Um, it's actually really nice that they're giving us a full day to look at it. If you guys have been around Olympia for any amount of time, you know that sometimes they will release their budget and then hold their hearing two hours later. So that's a whole lot of scrambling to figure out what's in it. Um, the revenue forecast came out yesterday. Um, the revenue, this is the revenue forecast that is used in building our state budget. So although the revenue is forecasted throughout the course of the year, I would say that this is the most important revenue forecast that they get. That revenue forecast was up um, a little bit from the previous revenue forecast. So it's always worth remembering that when, a, when they say revenue forecast is up, what they mean is from the previous forecast. So it's worth a reminder that back in June, the revenue forecast tanked and was just known to be in the, you know, we were going to have no money. People were freaking out, including me. And then every revenue forecast since then, so this will be the third since that forecast, the the forecasts have gone up slightly. So I would say that we're almost at par from where we were a year ago, which is, is pretty astonishing um, and, and really wonderful. What that really means is we don't have to make drastic and dramatic uh, cuts to human services. Um, additional to the increase, the slight increase in revenue has been um, uh, the federal money. So as you all know, there's lots of federal money that's coming in. Legislators are still trying to figure that out. We're a little bit in a time crunch in that there's a lot of uncertainty still about the guidance from the federal government on some of those money buckets. So what I heard yesterday was that, at least in the Senate anyway, they are planning on, they're planning on, in their budget that comes out next week, they will spend the child care money and they will spend the K-12 money. They will not be spending any of the other federal monies in the budget that comes out next week. And the reason for that is they are still waiting for additional guidance from the feds on how they can expend that money. And they're unwilling to sort of put something out there that risks that. So um, the federal stimulus pad honestly say has been a blessing, but it also does complicate the last few weeks of session. So I think that that's a whole lot of information. I don't know if I have any time for questions. Allison, you tell me um, if there's any other burning issues. Thank you so much, Melanie. I think what we will do is invite people to put questions for you in the chat so that we have time to cover some of the other things. And I thank you so much for explaining this um, complicated process. And this is the, the um, point at which I just wanna remind people who might not be too familiar with the state legislative advocacy environment that you just heard Melanie describe a lot of things that seem pretty big and abstract. We have the budget 
investments that we care deeply about. We also have policy bills that we care deeply about that Melanie has been doing lots and lots of work on our collective behalf around. And some of those include voting rights restoration for people with previous felony convictions, ensuring that a modern version of redlining doesn't prevent our ability to cite and open shelters and housing projects, um, increasing the TANF grant, lots of other policy bills that are also still live. So these two pieces, they intersect <laughs> because a lot of times you have to pay for things like a TANF grant increase. Um, but I wanna just let you know that if you, if you heard what Melanie said and wondered what about voting rights restoration, um, <laughs> that both, both sets of activities are happening simultaneously and they interact. Um, so Selena has some actions that people can take. I think you all know that sending emails and signing in now pro or sometimes con, but at this point, mostly pro on bills that we care about is one really important way for you to use your own voices, but also to invite your um, coworkers, families, friends, neighbors, and the people you work with and serve to use their voices. Um, there are still opportunities for public testimony. Um, Poverty Action and the Housing Alliance are doing a great job of supporting people. There's a hearing going on right this morning where um, we know there are some uh, folks who, who provide direct services who are contributing their voices there. And um, what I'd like to suggest um, is that Selena, if you could put some, a couple of the action links in the chat, I want to speak briefly about a piece of the budget that is known as the provisos. <laughs> um, and these are pieces of the budget that reflect certain kinds of advocacy that doesn't necessarily fit as a bill, but that is going to require an investment of resource money and, um, and tell you briefly about a few key areas that, um, that together we have been working um, with with partners and with lawmakers on. One is that we are um, sending a letter in support of the request to create a statewide um, staffed task force to address missing and murdered indigenous women. This is a request that came to us through our members and partners at the Seattle Indian Health Board and many um, native serving and native led organizations. Um, I think we are um, going to ask those folks to speak to that proviso um, probably either next month or in May. Uh, we have also worked with lawmakers to um, develop a proviso that is in process, I would say, that helps to address some of the issues related to using federal FEMA dollars to reimburse local jurisdictions for non-congregate shelter. Um, those of you in Seattle may be very well aware of the frustrations around how slow the city of Seattle has been to engage um, with that potential source of funding. But what I wanna say is that we see that hesit hesitancy in communities all across Washington state. And so we've worked with the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance and folks in other counties to try to understand what are the reasons that local jurisdictions might not have the funding to put up front to wait for reimbursement or might not have the information clearly enough about what non-congregate shelter expenses can be reimbursed. And we're hoping to create through a budget proviso um, a pool of resource that will basically help to offset those hesitancies and concerns and make sure that um, communities can use federal FEMA dollars to create non-congregate shelter. This is a pandemic that is not going to be ending anytime soon. And despite our, um, our gladness about vaccines, we know there are um, various strains. <laughs> there, there's a long way, um, a long road ahead of us. So the importance of non-congregate sheltering and its value and benefit to human beings um, is very real. And we wanna do everything we can to ensure that communities can take up that 100% federal reimbursement opportunity. Um, so those are a couple of quick 
pieces um, about other advocacy. Selena, um, I want to make sure to give you a little time to talk about the action links that you put in the box. Those of you who know about our, um, our who, who've been with us for in-person meetings, you know that sometimes we just pause a meeting and ask everyone to take out their cell phones and make a phone call during the meeting. And um, the coalition uh, membership is pretty well versed in what that means and what that looks like. Now it's even easier. You can just sit in the meeting and click on the link <laughs> and take the action. Um, so I wanna just touch on a couple of other um, topics. One of course is it's weighing on everyone's mind how profoundly um, concerning it is that our statewide eviction moratorium is set to expire on March 31st. You should know that there has been strong, strong advocacy, um, primarily through the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance and through many other partners um, to extend that eviction moratorium and to have the extension not just be, we hope, 30 days at a time, um, but to recognize that with the federal and state money to provide um, uh, rent assistance to tenants, uh, rent assistance to landlords, um, uh, eviction prevention, and, um, and legal representation for tenants and uh, home ownership for foreclosure prevention, it's going to take a fair amount of time to set those systems and processes up or to expand them as we expect and hope will happen. And also it would be a disaster for the eviction moratorium to end before that happens and frankly, before the school year ends. So the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance has a letter that you can sign on to as an individual and that organizations can sign on to. And I wanna warmly encourage everyone on this call, not only to sign it personally, but to bring it back to your respective agencies to sign on to this. I believe the deadline is um, sometime tomorrow and the more the merrier. The request is to extend the statewide eviction moratorium through July 31st, at least. Even that is probably going to be um, something that's going to just create um, an enormous worry, but it gives time for a lot of really important resources to be put into place and for mechanisms of support to be um, tested and strengthened and to really prevent as many people from ever experiencing homelessness as possible. So sign on deadline is tomorrow at two. Thank you so much, Nicholas. I, I see many things coming through the chat, but I haven't been able to read them all, so my apologies. Um, so thank you all for, for doing that. Then just very briefly, a couple of other um, things that I wanna talk about. Y you may have heard or read in Erica C. Barnett's um, publication about a ballot initiative slash charter amendment in the city of Seattle, that Seattle business interests, primarily the Seattle Chamber of Commerce and the Downtown Seattle Association um, are promoting, are planning to, um, as I understand it, introduce or file rather um, very shortly that is related to homelessness. Um, we have not yet seen the full text. We have seen portions of the text that I think both include some things that we can all agree on, i.e. people should not have to live in public spaces, and include some things that we have strong disagreement about, like what the response to that realistically can and must be. I would say that um, we're hoping to get information, <laughs> more full information about that, and to ensure that um, the folks who are promoting it understand that housing and specifically permanent supportive housing is the evidence-based solution for people's experience of chronic homelessness. And any proposal that doesn't fund and expand that solution is um, unlikely to do anything positive or beneficial for members of our community, whether they are housed or not. So we have some strong um, advocacy ahead of us 
Um, I think it's our, our hope that we will be able to um, inform that process, but only probably up to a certain point. And so I just want you not to be blindsided, I guess, when um, this starts coming out. It's obvious that this set of issues is already of key importance to people all across our city and all across our community. Um, but I think we have to continue to um, hold firm about what solutions work, what we know works, and what it costs to go to scale and not pretend that there is a cheaper or faster way to address um, the large scale suffering and crisis that we are experiencing in our communities. So we'll try to um, keep you all informed and welcome your thoughts about effective, intelligent messages. Um, I see that there's been lots of activity in the chat. My apologies that I haven't been able to track it. Um, I want to note that it's now 10 o'clock. I can hardly believe that we are on schedule. That's great testament to Jason and to all of you. Um, and I think um, because director uh, Patty Hayes has now joined us and we have Tara Bostock from the State Department of Health with us, I'm gonna say we will um, come back of course to our policy and advocacy issues. Um, I wanna welcome Tara Bostock from the State Department of Health and uh, director Patty Hayes from Public Health Seattle and King County. We're so grateful to both of you very busy people for joining us. This is such an important time. And um, uh, while you weren't with us, um, Patty, for the beginning of our meeting, I just want to reiterate that we feel great hope um, in the understanding, not only that we have three effective vaccines available, but also that, um, that service providers have finally been recognized as um, being essential enough to be eligible now. And yet we also understand the tension that there is not adequate supply even for those who are eligible. So um, we're so grateful to the to the people at the Public Health Department for Seattle and King County and to the people at the State Department of Health. This is, for me personally, I will say as someone who worked in public health for many years, um, the small ray of hope within this dark cloud of COVID-19, which is that finally homeless service and housing providers and public health folks have been working so closely together in this last year that we, we see the, the imperative to align our work more closely, um, to have this, these bodies of work be seen and understood to be deeply, profoundly, necessarily connected. And we hope that there are opportunities going forward for us to deepen that partnership. I wanna give Tara a little bit of time um, to share this new definition and what it means. And then um, we'll welcome you, um, Director Hayes. And um, so I will um, first turn things over to you, Tara. And apologies because I'm terrible with titles. Could you please introduce yourself, Tara, so pe people know what your background is? Absolutely, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm very honored to be here. I um, work at the Department of Health. I'm leading the outreach and engagement for people experiencing homelessness around vaccine in particular. Um, I'm part of the health promotion and education team as well as the um, community relations and equity team. So I will just get right to it so that I can hand it off to Patty. Um, so I'm gonna share uh, a little PowerPoint and I'll do this as quickly as I can. And let's see if I can do this. <laughs> so first, I want to just say thank you all for, for continuing to, to bring uh, up the important issues facing homeless service providers to the Department of Health and really pushing us um, and being at our collaborative meetings and sending us letters. Um, I really, really appreciate all of you um, for doing that and, um, and for bringing up your barriers and, and everything that's been going on for you uh, during this pandemic. The expanded definition that we were able to update means that um, homeless service providers who fit these categories are eligible as of yesterday. Um, so you are, let me just move this thing so I can read it, <laughs> eligible if um, their work responsibilities are similar to those of, el of an eligible social worker or as 
like are essential to the public health and safety of the people they serve. And they are interacting with a high volume of people over extended periods of time, i.e. three or more hours in a 24 hour day. And the nature of their work includes crisis response as similar to other um, eligible first responders in this category, which is beyond general social services work. Other staff and volunteers who do not meet this eligibility requirement are eligible um, in phase 1B tier 4. Um, it is my impression that this should fit a lot of folks who work um, in uh, homeless shelters and domestic violent, violent shelters as volunteers and staff. Um, and so uh, Allison also shared this definition in the um, chat and um, I will also share my email address in the chat. So if you have any questions um, for me, you can uh, send them my way. I wanna just really quickly um, also show exactly how folks can get access um, through Phase Finder um, so that it shows that they are eligible. So for the question of, um, are you considered a critical worker according to the Washington Critical Infrastructure Work List? You would select yes for that. And then on the next page, um, select which of the following statements best applies to your employment. Please only select something if you were, you know, whatever. Um, you would select, I work in the fire department, law enforcement, or as a social worker responding to public health or safety. So that will, um, that, that's it. That's how you can gain access to uh, eligibility through phase finder and, and get that form filled out appropriately so um, you can get vaccinated. So that's, um, I don't know how to, okay, I think I stopped sharing. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so that's really it for me. I just wanted to do that really as quickly as possible. I'll throw my um, email address in there and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks Many again. thanks, Tara. We, we really appreciate all the work that you and your colleagues have been doing, talking to folks in our community and all across the state and advocating internally um, for rational and informed decisions um, like this one. So um, we'll, we'll do our best to get uh, Tara's information out to people in a variety of ways. I wanna welcome um, Director Patty Hayes from Public Health Seattle and King County. I wanted to uh, just let you know, Patty, that um, uh, Jody Rao from Healthcare for the Homeless Network did a, a little bit at the top of our meeting to talk about what's currently known about how to support um, service providers in getting access to vaccines and then the planning that is underway, of course, for people without homes who also will need vaccination. Um, and I wanted to just give you a, a little bit of space and time to um, introduce yourself and, and share some thoughts. And then we'll have what I hope is just some dialogue. I mean, inevitably also questions and answers, but I, I hope this is just the first of maybe a, a longer opportunity for some conversation with you about the intersections of um, health, homelessness, housing, racism, and, um, and what we can all do about those intersections. So welcome and thank you. Thanks so much, Allison. And uh, I just wanna start by thanking everybody on the call today. Uh, first of all, the fact that you come together uh, like this and, and work together is just so important, obviously, to the success that we've had to date uh, in this horrible pandemic and, and all the residual effects that is going to uh, affect so many people for so, so very long, so very long to, to kind of pull us out of it. And I think that you're right in that this uh, one light at the tunnel here, we all are, uh, are so excited about. But I think it's great to reflect that um, how we've all hung together and the strategies that we put together in King County with your help, with your commitment. And I, I know it's been so hard and so stressful, so scary. Uh, you, you work in, in the highest of vulnerability areas. I'm just so grateful because I can tell by the data over time how well all of your work has played out with my team. Teams, <laughs> testing teams, <laughs> uh, infection control teams. Uh, I, I mean, we, from the very beginning in our equity work had a commitment to find the way to work with you all 
that it was a path not not put together yet across the country. I mean, clearly, I think it's great to sit in space together and recognize that you all uh, and public health together, we created the way forward for the country. I really believe that. I mean, I can see it. I don't, I don't know if you all saw, but over the last couple of months, there's been a number of evaluations done and ratings and King County has continued to come up as one, if not the top county in the continental United States. There was one rating based upon just case number of cases. The only major metropolitan area that was better than us was Honolulu, Hawaii. Now we would all like to be in Honolulu, Hawaii for sure, but they locked the entire island down. I mean, I don't compare that. That feels apples and oranges to me. <laughs> So, I, I mean, that, um, it's been such a long year, but I know that uh, you have saved lives and just the ability for us, as I watch even isolation and quarantine and the utilization of that, I can, I can see the excellence in your work to try and protect people, contain things as we develop new strategies and you have to quickly alter and be flexible with us. It's just amazing and it's made a huge difference. So, I mean, that was one of the main things that I wanted to share with my heart with all of you today. Um, it is indeed, as you said, Ellis, really frustrating that there's only one dose of vaccine for every eight people that are qualified right now. Uh, and that is gonna continue for another three weeks. So I wanna be very transparent about that. I've looked at DOH's methodology for the three-week projection on what vaccines are going to be available. And DOH is not expecting any more of the J&J &J vaccine that would have been so helpful had some of that federally been available before uh, the week of the 5th of April, but it doesn't appear it is. Things can change. I mean, every day something changes. Um, as we speak, things are probably morphing at the federal level. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, I just want to be transparent about that because I don't, uh, the biggest hurt right now is that people are so anxious to get the vaccine and they get so frustrated when they can't find a space. So uh, I'm glad that they've adjusted and, and, and DOH is showing you how to use Space Finder. Um, I'm, I'm, I know our team will work with you but I wanna acknowledge that it is gonna be frustrating and you're going to have staff that's uh, upset and frustrated and I apologize for that. We will get through this. There's going to be a floodgate opening sometime in April. And then President Biden, I mean, I, I know DOH is still talking about all these phases, but the truth of the matter right now is uh, that President Biden has declared that as of the 1st of May, everybody's gonna, He's basically throwing phases out. <laughs> so so uh, how we're gonna manage that, the good news here in the county, I can tell you is that we have over 300 approved providers, 300, but all over the county of folks who are ready to deliver vaccine. DOH has done an amazing job working with all of these providers who are ready. The number that received first doses last week was 34. So there's a hunger by all these providers to be to give the vaccine, but only 34 got them last week. So um, that again, but I, I tell you that to, to, to show to you that we're really committed here to build the infrastructure so that when the vaccines are available, we're ready, we're ready. We briefed Dow yesterday. It's very clear to me that we can handle 300,000 doses a week. I think we can handle 350 to 400,000. So we're, there's no doubt we can get the vaccines out. And what Dr. Duchin and I are talking about now is I think what happens when the floodgates open, it's gonna flip very quickly to working with you on folks that are vac vaccine hesitant mm -hmm. and how are we gonna approach those folks and how are we gonna help those folks in our communities of color who rightly so don't trust government and rightly so uh, want to ask questions, but also 
are being, I think, really barraged with misinformation and rumors that we need credible voices, which often are not government voices to help get that message. So we have lots of strategies that we're working with navigators from communities and community leaders to try and begin to address that as I think that's gonna flip if indeed President Biden feels that we're gonna have this happen in May, it's gonna flip really quickly and we're gonna see who is vaccine hesitant. And I'm sure you'll discover with your volunteers and, um, uh, and clients and as well as staff, there are going to be a certain percentage of folks that don't want vaccine. Mm -hmm. We'll have to talk about how, how to handle that uh, and how to protect everybody. So with that, Allison, I think I'll, I'll stop there. Happy to dialogue and uh, thank you. with you. Thank you so much. It's, it's so helpful to hear from the top. <laughs> and I do want to remind people who may not be so familiar with this that, um, you know, when you hear our public health department director um, speak about vaccine supply not being available, I just want to remind everyone that's not a decision that we get to make that Director Hayes gets to make that is a decision that is happening first at the federal level, then at the state level. And so, um, you know, what you hear is the combination of planning, learning, anticipation. Um, so I, I thank you so much for being so candid and um, transparent with us and for recognizing that um, there are a lot of good reasons that there may be. Uh, um, be hesitancy or concern. I want to just note for, for you, Patty, that of course, um, some of the best trusted uh, messengers are folks on this call or their colleagues and guests and residents and staff. And I really hope that we can continue our work with public health folks to, um, to listen to those people and what they have to tell us um, about how to make sure that this rollout is um, equitable and effective. And we're excited to partner on that work. Um, I have, I know that there is, uh, that there's at least one person who sent me a, a message saying that they wanted to ask a question of you. I think people maybe are digesting the flood of information, both what you've shared and what they've gotten in the previous hour and a quarter. Um, I will just invite, I think it's uh, Christopher, um, who is with Share? Hi there. Who um, can can you please unmute yourself? I think you have a question that you wanted to ask of Director Hayes, and please go certainly. Ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Christopher Anderson. I am a Share participant who lives at their bunkhouse shelter, and also on the board of directors. Uh, yesterday, we sent you a letter. Uh, we asked you and County Executive Constantine to send public health COVID-19 vaccinators to our shelters and in, in the same way that we had uh, COVID testers uh, sent to all of our shelters. Uh, we're grateful for the skill and the compassion and, and the professionalism of the public health workers uh, that we encountered uh, from the HEART team. Uh, there are people in my shelter who have no trust, low trust in, in the American healthcare system, as you uh, uh, heard earlier, uh, some for good reason. Uh, there are people in my shelter who are unable to access the system due to the barriers that are, you know, including physical disabilities and language. Um, if the vaccination teams don't come to us, a good percentage of people won't get vaccinated. So that, uh, this is why we hope that the health teams can visit our shelters. Uh, will the public health be able to do this? So this is a great and timely, uh, and I believe that uh, my staff has already responded uh, to that letter. Um, so I'm glad you asked the question. So our uh, plan has always been, so, so let me back up. Uh, for those of you that don't know, our uh, vaccine strategy plan that we've presented to the executive and to council is called multimodal. What that means is we fully know that uh, in order to be successful, we can't count on any one strategy that will work for everybody. And we particularly know this from our interactions with you all and also our BIPOC community leaders, faith community leaders. So um, you'll see that we are not assuming that mass vaccination sites need to be everywhere and that that's the answer to everything because we felt from the very beginning that wasn't. It, it seems to be sort of a message 
that often um, gets lost from the, the federal. I understand why the president is emphasizing all that, and that's all well and good. But here, I want you to know that that's not our belief. Uh, and the multimodal strategy actually for the, the, the uh, homeless uh, service providers is planned to be done through a mobile strategy. So we have 20 mobile teams out right now, which are working to finish uh, the adult family homes and the gap that uh, emerged really quickly with the assumption that the pharmacies were gonna take care of the long-term care system. And that really, of course, wasn't gonna happen. So we've been focused on that. We do uh, need to use uh, mobile strategies to do uh, homebound elderly and disabled. So we are assessing those numbers because uh, those again are folks that uh, can't get out, uh, are, are too limited or it's too dangerous for them to get out. So we're gonna be looking at our mobile teams uh, and uh, if we need to build more capacity. So as we get more vaccine and we develop this with you, um, uh, we're looking at that model you described and a mobile strategy to come to come out, and it may be maybe a mixed uh, mixed thing as well. Because if there was uh, a pop up that occurred uh, through uh, I don't know a church that was nearby that was a real trusted uh, partner, that might work too. So so we're not hard and fast in one thing. But I wanted to let you know that the mobile strategy was always a uh, part of our multimodal for, for uh, homeless service providers. Thank you. You bet. Thank you so much. I, I, I will say I have, um, I have the privilege, I guess, of being in many, many meetings <laughs> with public health and, and of being able to see the extent to which public health has really sought to learn as we have gone through this pandemic and really tried to set up structures, including the pandemic and racism community advisory group and many other um, vehicles and structures through which community members, partners who are very often at the margins can actually be in the center. And um, you know, I appreciate that there, we are a very, very broad and um, diverse group of people as well as organizations. But I think the more that people bring your experiences, your ideas to um, the coalition, the more we can share those with public health in, uh, in other spaces. Um, I know that there is so much more that we could say and also, Jason has some really important information about um, helping people without homes or addresses or a history of paying taxes get their stimulus checks. Um, also important for public health to, um, <laughs> to have access to the cash that people need um, to do what they need to do. And I know that there's so much, uh, there are many other additional questions. Um, Patty, I, I really thank you for taking the time to, to be with us. I think there are a few additional questions that maybe we will um, pass on to you. And I think I just wanna recognize there are a number of questions about, um, you know, we, we, this, is a, this is a rapidly evolving situation. Yesterday, <laughs> we got this news. Today, we are having this conversation. And thank you to Megan for pointing out to me that Governor Inslee is giving a press conference today at 2.30. And very often, Governor Inslee's press conferences contain more <laughs> changes um, and evolution. So thank you, Megan, for tagging that. Um, thank you, Patty, for joining us. We will um, be continuing, of course, this conversation because the thousands and thousands of people experiencing homelessness, um, unless they are in currently eligible categories, are also among the folks who need to get vaccine access. So um, we look forward to having an additional opportunity for a probably more reflective conversation, but thank you so much for being with us on this really important um, meeting day. And um, thank you for your work. I, I, I wanna say I, um, I know that you and Dr. Duchin are tireless public servants and tireless may not be a fair word to use because I'm sure you're exhausted. Um, 
but I also know that um, that this community would be in a very different place if we didn't have uh, public health leadership that was as dedicated to um, seeing and naming the failures of our systems as well as the strengths of our systems and responding accordingly. So really want to recognize and acknowledge and thank you for being a, an honest partner um, and such a dedicated leader in our Thank community. you, Allison, and thank you to everybody because it takes all of us together to make this happen. So my pleasure, always happy to come back. Uh, just let me know. We appreciate that and we'll take you up on it. Thank you so much. All right, Jason, over to you. Thank you, Allison. With the last five minutes or so we have of our meeting, we wanna go over a quick handful of updates, um, starting with um, reminding folks that the coalition is in the middle of our 2021 membership drive. Um, as many of you know, the coalition is a membership driven organization. We rely on the engagement of you all, plus the um, contributions from your organizations to power our work in the community. Uh, we suspended our 2020 drive in recognition of the financial impact that COVID-19 had and asked folks to consider building um, dues into their 2021 budget. Um, we are thrilled to publicly thank um, uh, a handful of organizations who have already submitted their membership dues to us. Um, we have a list here of folks who have submitted their materials to us that we want to just take a moment to publicly acknowledge. Um, for those who might still be in process, thank you so much. Um, we will create other opportunities to thank you at future meetings. As you can see, we have organizations large and small across King County. Um, thank you to Child Care Resources, Elizabeth Gregory Home, Fair Start, Jewish Family Service, the Kent Lutheran Church, King County Housing Authority, um, our friends at the top of the meeting from the Healthcare for the Homeless Network, Lake Washington United Methodist Church Safe Parking Program, the Multi-Service Center, New Beginnings, Operation Night Watch and Operation Sack Lunch, the Pike Market Senior Center and Food Bank, Queen Anne Helpline, Recovery Cafe, St. Stephen Housing Association, Teen Feed, and the Auburn Food Bank. Um, this represents roughly 20 to 25 organizations. We hope to have our membership include 60 to 70 organizations, both of those who have been supporters of us historically, as well as new organizations that we've been able to bring into our work. If you believe that your organization belongs on this list, we agree. Please send myself or our operations director, Aileen, uh, who is also on the call here, an email, and we will uh, make this process as smooth and easy for you as we possibly can. And then we wanted to share just a couple of uh, resources and surveys to be aware of. Um, Allison mentioned that we have a new round of economic impact payments to be aware of, otherwise known as stimulus checks. For um, folks working with people experiencing homelessness um, or folks who face barriers to traditional banking, there are a collection of resources available to help you help the folks you're working with claim these benefits. Um, the good news is that the process to claim these benefits in 2021 is the same as it was in 2020. So the resource guide and materials that we compiled last summer will still work for this new round of benefits. Um, the Probably most important new piece of information to note is that the best way to, to help people claim these benefits is, if you can, to help them file a tax return. Um, a tax return can help someone claim their 2020 stimulus benefits if they didn't receive them, as well as their current one. Um, We'll put a link in the chat that includes um, some resources with United Way of King County. Most of United Way's tax prep assistance program is happening virtually, although they do have two in-person locations in King County that you can direct folks to, the um, Federal Way Multi-Service Center building, as well as the Dearborn Goodwill location. Um, these both have in-person public hours that we've posted to our website. Um, Again, please review the resources there. They are still valid in terms of the IRS non-filers portal. That is still an option for people who don't wish to file a tax return. Um, we will be providing updated information about this as it goes along. Um, tax season has been extended by one month. 
So taxes are not due until May 15th this year, giving folks a little more time to work through this process. We also wanted to highlight a survey that King County Metro wants direct service providers to fill out regarding the annual subsidized pass program. Um, this fall, Metro launched a program to provide free of cost ORCA lift cards to individuals who are 80% or below federal poverty limits, so low income riders. Right now, the program is, is available to people who qualify for six commonly used public assistance programs, and they are hoping to expand that eligibility in 2022 to include a broader swath of people. The survey is to inform Metro as to how they should prioritize that expansion, what populations and groups of people should be prioritized for that. Um, I believe we also have a link that one of my coworkers is going to put in the chat to that survey. We especially encourage you to fill this out if you are someone who has been working with folks to fill out these applications um, or you have insights to provide on the rollout. Um, so, uh, please um, submit your feedback there. We're looking for responses by uh, March 31st. And then finally, one more survey that we want to make you aware of. Uh, this is the King County Provider Wages and Benefits Survey. Um, this is something that's being funded by the Veterans, Seniors, and Human Services Program. It's an effort to capture what the working conditions are of nonprofit service staff in King County. Um, there are two components to this survey to be aware of. The first one is meant to capture really detailed information about wages and benefits. Um, this survey is currently open and is really designed for people with extensive knowledge um, of those things. So human resources managers, executive directors, um, accounting staff, things of that nature. Um, that survey is open now and will be open until May 2nd. The other survey is for frontline service staff themselves. Um, this one does not necessarily include detailed questions about wages and benefits, but it does include information about other workplace conditions. Um, what it's like, what's working well, and what's not working well. Why am I bringing this to your attention? Because this information can really help inform advocacy work. Um, two years ago, when the coalition launched our Adjust for Inflation campaign, where we won um, uh, legislation at the Seattle City Council to build cost of living adjustments into its human services contracts, we pulled information from a similar provider survey to make our case that frontline staff were not receiving sufficient cost of living adjustments. Um, so we really want to encourage folks to have this on your radar. Um, the survey for providers will be available starting uh, in two weeks on April 6th. Um, we want to get as many responses as possible so that our community can use our collective voice to speak to what's working well, what's not working well, and what needs to be changed. And I believe that that is everything that I have. Allison, do you have any uh, closing comments you wish to make? I just, I love that rousing explanation, Jason, about why to fill out yet another survey. <laughs> and I really hope that people listened and heard it and I'm gonna ask you to write it up, Jason, um, because really this is um, what I will just close us out with, I guess, which is we all know that the work you do is essential that you are essential, that the people you are working with and serving and providing housing, shelter, food, outreach, healthcare to, those folks are essential as well. What we haven't had is a system that recognizes the core necessity of this work being compensated, recognized and supported as essential. And gathering this information is going to help us in our long, long effort to strengthen and stabilize systems of care that really respond to and meet people's needs and are not just desperate efforts to hold back um, a tidal wave with a, a little pail <laughs> um, and some band-aids. So thank you all so much. Um, it's always so inspiring to see the level of energy and enthusiasm. We know there's a ton of information here. Um, 
that's why we record these. And um, and Sasha and Jason and Selena will work on a follow up message. And also you can go back and listen or share this meeting or parts of it if that's useful. Um, and yes, as Sasha is saying, please register and plan to join us for the April 15th meeting. Um, for our May 20th annual meeting, we're going to ask you to block out more than an hour and a half and have some um, joy with us as well. And also want to remind you about the Speak Up pop-up advocacy sessions on Tuesdays that Selena is facilitating that are lots of fun. Um, you can just drop in as well as the South King County Forum on Homelessness Meetings that Jason coordinates and facilitates with our friends at the City of Auburn. All that info is at homelessinfo.org. And we look forward to seeing and hearing from you all nonstop. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.